We will talk about gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, and hiatal or parasophageal hernias together because the treatments are essentially the same, even though sometimes the symptoms may be different. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a very common disease in which the LES, or lower esophageal sphincter, is not working very well and it allows the acid that is in the stomach to come up into the esophagus. The most common symptom of this is heartburn. Sometimes that acid can come up high enough that individuals will have an acid taste in their mouth. Sometimes whole food comes up uh, in regurgitation. There can be belching. Sometimes it can cause pain in the upper abdomen or chest. Uh, when one bends over or lies down, symptoms can become much worse. It can cause a chronic cough and hoarseness and can even lead to difficulty in swallowing. So all of these things can be caused by acid getting out of where it's supposed to normally be in the stomach and coming up into the esophagus. With a hiatal hernia, that is an opening in the diaphragm which allows the stomach to go up into the chest. That contributes to gastroesophageal reflux because the pressure in the chest is negative and the pressure in the, in the abdomen is positive. And so when the stomach gets up into the chest, it contributes to the acid moving up into the esophagus. And so repairing a hiatal hernia can help with reflux symptoms as well. Parasophageal hernias are when the lower esophageal sphincter stays in the correct location, but the top part of the stomach comes up through the diaphragm up into the chest. You can also get other organs come up into the chest when the hernia is very large. Typically, parasophageal hernias will cause more swallowing problems um, and can create a surgical emergency if the stomach that is up in the chest twists on itself. The surgical repair uh, to these diseases consists of two parts. One is the fundoplication, or wrap, and that is where we take the stomach wrap it around behind the esophagus and create this collar. That can be either a complete wrap, which is also called a Nissen fundoplication, or a partial wrap, which the most common of which is called a toupee fundoplication. The main purpose for the wrap is to increase the pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter to help decrease acid moving up into the esophagus. With the hiatal hernia or parasophageal hernia repairs, it also adds some bulk to the top of the stomach so it's less likely to sip th through the smaller opening where the esophagus is coming through the diaphragm after the hernia has been repaired. The second part of this repair is the hernia repair, and this sometimes will require mesh. If it is a small hernia, we will often just close it with sutures until this larger opening is tighter around the esophagus. If it's a large hernia, then it has a pretty high recurrence rate. So there are a variety of different techniques that are employed at different times to try to decrease the risk of these hernias coming back. One of those techniques is to take uh, some mesh and sew it in place. It often has a shape something like this, which fits into that space and helps reinforce that repair. It is usually a biological or other absorbable substance that is used uh, and will allow scarring to happen and then the mesh will go away. Another technique is to try to take the tension off this part of the closure. This can be done by making an incision in this part of the diaphragm or out here farther on this side of the diaphragm. And then the resulting hole that is created, sewing in a piece of mesh uh, 
to help cover that area. Another technique that is used is that sometimes this part of the anatomy where the esophagus comes into the stomach is too high. It's sitting right here at the opening of the diaphragm or sometimes even up into the chest. The problem with that is that if you then put a wrap around that area, that wrap is already going to be in the chest and so there's already a recurrent hernia. And so sometimes we have to do what we call esophageal lengthening. Now we're not really lengthening the esophagus, but what we're doing is we're cutting out a section of the stomach. So this part here goes away. And then that makes this tube that is the esophagus longer and then the wrap happens down here at this part of the uh, stomach. What that does it, is it allows that wrap to sit in the abdomen and so there's less pressure on it trying to get back up into the chest and that also can decrease the risk of recurrence. So all of those techniques are employed to try to decrease the chance of this hernia coming back. Now most of the time we do these operations laparoscopically or robotically. Occasionally we get in there and can't because of a variety of reasons and we have to make a large incision to be able to finish the operation. Alternatives to surgical treatment are lifestyle changes, watching what you eat, sleeping with the head of the bed raised, not drinking alcohol or smoking, and losing weight, because all of these things can make reflux symptoms worse. There are medications, antacids, H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, things like Prilosec, which are very effective at blocking acid and for most people will control their symptoms. There are some endoluminal therapies. What that means is coming down with an endoscope into the esophagus and doing some treatments from the inside. Some of those are experimental. Some of them uh, are currently being used, but most insurance companies do not cover them and they're not done in all locations. So who would be a candidate for surgery? Well, anyone who has an abnormal pH study. What that means is there's a test to measure what the pH is of the fluid right here in the lower esophagus. And if that is too low, that means acid is coming up into the esophagus. Or if on endoscopy, there's a lot of inflammation seen in that area, then we know that acid is coming up into that area even without a pH test. Um, if someone has reflux and the medications just aren't working anymore, that would be another reason uh, to proceed with surgery. And then also the desire to eliminate long-term medication usage. Most of the time when someone develops reflux, they're going to have to take their medications for the rest of their life to help keep those symptoms at bay. There can be some problems with taking those medications long-term, and that's something you'd want to discuss with your primary care provider, but those would be reasons to have surgery. Now, in order to make sure someone is a candidate for surgery, uh, most patients will need to have these studies done. An EGD, which is an endoscopy, where the gastroenterologist comes down and looks at the esophagus and at the stomach to see if there are any of those changes. A pH study, which is putting a probe in this area to measure acid exposure. Manometry is a test where a small tube is placed into the nose and down into the esophagus, and then they have you swallow water. What they're doing is they're measuring how well the esophagus works, how well it squeezes. Because you can imagine that if we're going to create a barrier down here for acid to come up, it's also a barrier for things to come down in. And so if the esophagus doesn't work very well, that can make it so you can't swallow and you can't get food down. So we need to know that ahead of time. So we use this manometry test to try to help understand that. And then a barium swallow is a test where you swallow dye 
in x-ray and we take some x-rays and watch the dye come down through the esophagus and into the stomach. This is the most accurate way to see if somebody has a hiatal or parasophageal hernia and what the actual size of that is. So assuming all of those come back appropriate, then one would be considered a, considered a candidate for surgical therapy as we've explained. Unfortunately, operations carry risks. Uh, every operation carries these risks, blood clots, pneumonia, heart attack, stroke, bleeding, infection. Specific to this operation, there may be some difficulty swallowing. Now, we expect that to happen initially. We're putting a wrap around the distal esophagus. There's going to be some swelling. It's going to be difficult to eat initially. So because of that, you will need to eat soft, mushy foods for two to four weeks, especially avoiding meats and breads, because those are most likely to get stuck in this area. However, this difficulty swallowing could become more long term. Again, that's another reason why we check the manometry test ahead of time. Sometimes that may require that this area be dilated to make it a little more loose. Sometimes it requires that the wrap actually be removed, but that's pretty uncommon for that to happen. A slipped wrap is a complication where this wrap comes down onto the stomach. That usually requires surgical correction. Fortunately, that's a pretty uncommon complication. Recurrence of the hernia. Now, I've mentioned before that that is a 50% possibility at five years. Some studies say that's even higher, as high as 60 or 70% at five years. Most of those recurrent hernias are small and don't need additional surgery, but some of them can be quite large. So again, another emphasis on why we do these different techniques to try to decrease the risk of these hernias coming back. Um, there's a small percentage chance that doing a wrap is not going to eliminate the reflux symptoms. That happens about 15% of the time. Usually in those patients, the reflux is better, it's just not completely gone. So they're able to take less medication, but it hasn't been completely eliminated. The other thing that should be mentioned here is that these repairs typically aren't lifelong. In other words, at some point, this wrap is going to loosen up. As we age, our tissues become more stretchy, and as that wrap loosens up, it's going to allow acid to start coming back up again. So these typically are not lifelong uh, repairs, and there may be some point down the ro road where symptoms come back bad enough that you may need to consider a redo surgery. Um, we definitely try to treat with medication prior to doing that, however. Perforation or making a hole in the stomach or esophagus, that's pretty uncommon. And as long as we recognize it and sew it up, it's not a big deal. Increased gas or bloating, that's fairly common after this operation. With this wrap, the air is not as easily able to go up into the esophagus. And individuals with reflux tend to swallow a lot of air. It's a mechanism that the body uses to keep the... Uh, acid back down in the stomach and then because the air can't come back up very easily uh, you can become uh, bloated or gassy. Difficulty or inability to burp or vomit. Everybody's a little bit different on this. Some can, some can't, but for most people it's different. It's not a bad different, it's just different. And then injury to the spleen or liver. Uh, these are uncommon complications that they're severe enough that anything additional needs to be done. Both the spleen and liver can cause some significant bleeding, but again, those are pretty uncommon complications. So after surgery, what can you expect? Uh, no heavy lifting for at least four to six weeks. If you have a very large hiatal hernia, that may be even longer, up to three months or so. Soft, mushy food for two to four weeks, especially avoiding meats and breads and your surgeon will help you know when you can start becoming more adventuresome with your diet. Chew food really well so things don't get stuck. We may uh, even talk to you about what pills you're taking uh, to try to either crush or use liquid forms to minimize the chances of them getting stuck. 
You will have a decreased stomach capacity when we use part of that stomach in the wrap. There's not as much stomach left to fill up, so you'll notice that you get full more quickly. This will often lead to some weight loss uh, over the month or two after surgery. And then eating smaller meals, meals more frequently is one way to get around that if you don't have any weight to lose. Speaking of weight, there is one condition that makes uh, the failure of this much higher, and that is obesity. If someone has a BMI over 40, this is not the right operation to do. And most professionals and experts would actually say that if the BMI is over 35, this is not the right operation to do. And there are even some that say a BMI of 30 is even too high. And that's just because of the high rates of failure and recurrence that exists, which are made much more worse with obesity. So if that is your situation, talk to your surgeon and they can talk to you about some other alternatives. So if you have any additional questions, please also ask those of your surgeon.